Coming up on DTNS, Boston Dynamics is finally selling a robot. Amazon wants to free you to use whatever voice assistant you feel like and why, I don't know, maybe you might not want the right to sell a used video game. Oh my gosh. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 24th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from a place where people can't wait for February 21st, I'm Patrick Beja. And uh, from a place where people eat lunch, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just getting Patrick's uh, thoughts on the release of The Last of Us Part 2 date, February 21st. One week after Valentine's Day, uh, and as you can tell, Patrick, you are excited. Am I am I picking that up right? Uh, I think that might be the understatement of the year, nay, the decade. <laughs> if you want more of Patrick's thoughts on that PlayStation announcement, as well as our thoughts on lunch, get the wider conversation at Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The EU's top court has ruled that Google does not have to apply the right to be forgotten globally, meaning that after receiving an appropriate request, Google only needs to remove links from its search results in Europe. The EU court also issued a second ruling that links do not automatically have to be removed just because they contain information like a person's sex life or a criminal conviction. But such listings should be kept where, quote, strictly necessary for people's freedom of information rights to be preserved. Sanity has prevailed, in my opinion. In my opinion. Transport for London has renewed Uber's license to operate for two months with new requirements for passenger safety. TFL has, re- uh, has requested additional information from Uber, which it will evaluate before deciding whether to issue a full five-year license in November. Kicking that can down the road a little bit. Uh, Source tells CNBC that Amazon is working on wireless earbuds that could track metrics like distance run, your pace, your calories burned right from your ears. Earbuds are codenamed Puget, like Puget Sound up in Washington, and are expected to have a built-in accelerometer and be priced below $100. Same source also told CNBC that Amazon is working on a larger Echo device with better sound quality. Amazon has a hardware announcement Wednesday. Uh, It's not known if these products will be part of that announcement, but I guess we'll find out tomorrow. Spotify also had a couple updates today. The Spotify for Artists app also now shows how many people worldwide are listening to a track for the first week after a new track goes live. There's also a new home tab and more info on gaining followers and getting added to playlists. For Spotify users, two new playlists have been launched. On Repeat plays the tracks that you played the most over the last 30 days. And Repeat Rewind collects your favorite songs from a month ago so you can revisit them. Hmm, Nifty stuff. All right, let's talk a little more about that Amazon uh, initiative to to free the voice assistants, Patrick. Mm, Amazon announced the Voice Interoperability Initiative with more than 30 companies pledging to make sure smart devices work with multiple digital assistants. Intel's 10th gen chips will support multiple assistants this year. Qualcomm said its chips support multiple wake words now. Salesforce said they will work to put its Einstein Einstein assistant on Army device. Any device. Any device, I'm sorry. Um, Maybe, you know, Army devices... (laughs) That that goes under any. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a subset. (laughs) Spotify said it wants to let users ask Spotify for things directly. Baidu brings its 400 million users of Duo OS to the initiative as well. Microsoft, Sony, Sony Audio Group, Tencent, Orange, and Verizon are among the other companies signed on. Google, Apple, and Samsung are not, though Samsung's owned Harman is. Yeah, so I I wouldn't be shocked to see Samsung join this. They they already do dual assistance with Google Assistant and Bixby, uh, and Harman's already part of this, so it's not like there's some corporate, you know, mandate that says no one in the corporate you know, in the K ball can can join, but uh, I wouldn't be I would be would be surprised to see Google or Apple rush to join this, especially Apple. Apple just doesn't join stuff. Um, but I like this initiative to a point. It's not an open platform. It's just an initiative with everybody saying we would like to cooperate with each other, uh, and it's not saying you can swap out your assistants. It's saying devices can have multiples, right? So 
it's not the same as saying, oh, I'd like to run Amazon's voice assistant on a Google Home. It's saying my Google Home, and maybe Google's a bad example because they're not in this initiative, but if they were to join, my Google Home could have multiple voice assistants, which I feel like in some ways that's kind of cool because let's say Spotify has their voice assistant. I could just say, Spotify, play the song versus, hey, what's your name? Tell Spotify to play the song, which would be a little more, which would make more sense. But then if I had Cortana and uh, uh, Alex on my voice assistant and an alarm went off, I have to remember which one I set the alarm with to know which one to tell to stop it, right? Okay, so so Amazon wanting to sort of uh, you know be at the forefront of this, I get that that is sort of a we're playing nice, no competitive stuff going on here, even though we're uh, arguably you know the 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 leader in uh, assistant technology, right? Or at least you know as far as consumer uh, adoption. But why does Amazon want to do this exactly otherwise? Oh, I, I, I generally don't believe any company ever does something to appear nice unless they already have another motivation for it. And I think the motivation here is Amazon is behind Google in devices and wants to make their devices more operable and feels like, you know, even if this means there are alternatives to Google or, or to, to our uh, voice assistant out there, we'll still s sell more devices by having more ways into the tent. If you mm -hmm. Well, let's put it that way. No device that can use multiple assistants is not going to have Amazon's assistant. Right. They're very it. secure in that belief, I'm yes. sure. Yeah, exactly. So Google and Apple are kind of playing in a different field. But if this happens, Amazon will be even more everywhere. Yeah, and then they can market like we're the only one that lets you talk directly to the thing you want to talk to. Everybody else makes you go through their voice assistant. So yeah, and uh, I, honestly, I would attribute this to Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft was the first to open themselves up to this with Cortana, and Amazon was the first to take advantage of it. ZDNet's Mary Joe Foley found references at theartofresearch.org to a brand new data dignity team at Microsoft headed by Christian Leensberger. Leensberger is principal PM manager and advisor to Microsoft CTO Kevin Scott. So it seems like this team is inside the CTO's office. Previously, Mary Joe Foley had found a website now hidden describing something called Project Bali, a research incubation project designed to give users a way to store visualize, manage, control, share, and monetize their own data. This is uh, very similar to Project Solid over at MIT that you might have heard me talk about before. In a New York Times interview published today with Microsoft Chief Scientist Jaron Lanier, Lanier mentions the term data dignity and argues that people should get paid for their personal data. So it seems to be right in there. Foley also notes that a Microsoft job posting refers to applying mixed reality to the practical use of deep learning and data dignity. So be on the lookout for this. I love the idea if I know more details about this and it's open so that you know more people can be involved. That's why I like Project Solid. Maybe this is gonna incorporate Project Solid somehow, I don't know. Uh, but, but yes, somebody needs to figure out how to make a good, solid, open way for us to manage our own data and be in control of it. And I think one of the big questions that comes in the next sentence is, okay, but how much? And there was a paper just recently about the fact that we really don't know what personal data is worth and the different ways of making estimates are so different and come to such different results that it's kind of not even, we're not certain it's worth exploring. But another way of looking at it is maybe if someone manages to put this together, a system that that lets you manage your data and maybe sell it and you put it on the market and you see how much it's worth and after a couple of years uh maybe we'll know and people will decide if it's worth uh monetizing it or not and uh how it relates to when you do that uh voluntarily or not on um websites that you use for free yeah that part of it is is the big question mark for me i don't hate the idea of being more in control of my data that sounds great but it's sort of like Okay, well, if there are ads served to me that I find uh, s sort of random, they don't make a lot of sense. I mean, would that be part of me being more in charge of that? And if yeah. so, you know, like there's sort of a self-serving thing that 
is a little hard to wrap my head around because we don't do things that way now. Right. Yeah. The, to me, uh, more and more with digital content, I feel like access is the important thing. Don't worry about price. Don't worry about distribution access to the data. And what this would do, I hope, is control access to my data. To your point, Patrick, where what I get charged for the data doesn't matter to me. It's who am I allowing to see my data and at what uses are they using it for, which to your point, Sarah, would then allow me to say like, okay, these ads are weird. I'm not going to allow this company to have my data anymore because I don't like to see that kind of stuff or, 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 or be able to, to control what ads you see. You know, it's true. Out of the five or six words that are describing the features it would do, I only focused on the last one, which is monetize. But there's also store, visualize, manage, control, and share, which are equally uh, as important. Also, I love the term data dignity. I think it's super catchy, and it's uh, it's a great way of naming it. It's a little bit highfalutin, but yeah. Yeah, but it, it, I, I see how it could catch on. Yeah. Xiaomi announced the Mi Mix Alpha, which it calls a concept smartphone, with a screen that wraps around the side and most of the way around the back for a 180 degree percent screen to body ratio. Network signal and battery life icons display on the side, which also has a pressure sensitive volume button. There's only one camera since you use the screen on the back for selfies using the 108 megapixel Samsung Center sensor. Rather, a small scale production begins this year for sale December Starting in December for 20,000 won, which is about 2,800 US dollars, Xiaomi also announced the Mi 9 Pro 5G that can charge wirelessly in 69 minutes. The phone starts at 36,000 won, or about US $520, and coming to China first. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the the Mi 9 Pro 5G is really just the Mi 9 Pro with 5G and a, and a few well bells and whistles, but it's it's arguably you know super affordable at, at $529. Whereas the uh, Mi Mix Alpha, I think uh, Sarah, you were saying in our pre-show today uh, how it's just showing that now we're just coming up with new ways to make a phone look different. Like, right. I don't know right. if I need this, but you know, the selfie thing, I was the first thing I'm like, well, that's kind of practical. And it certainly is pretty though. Yeah, it's pretty, but it's like, is it functional? And and I don't have this phone, and mm -hmm. it might be. And, you know, we're. I think that this is. The, we're in the area of of you know we're we're at the point where phone manufacturers, at least the companies who have enough money to do enough R and D, are like, okay, how do we differentiate ourselves? Let's get weird. And this <laughs> is one of those things where I'm like, I don't know. It sounds a little weird. Might be cool, uh, but uh, we. You know, we we as consumers would need to be trained into why it's cool rather than wanting this feature. It's something that a company is like, hey, we did this. Do you like it? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that without being talking in absolutes, it's probably not incredibly useful of a feature to have a, a phone wrapped in a screen. Um, I I think I might be wrong, but I think it's okay to say it's probably not. And it's a concept, uh, a concept phone. There, they usually don't go to market. Concept uh, designs don't go to market as such. It's a fun thing to try and see if something might come out of it. But I doubt that, as it stands, um, it would be considered a must-have feature. It's very useful for selfies. Sure. You could just have a screen on the back for your selfie needs. Well, well, this one does, or and it's really it. pretty. Yeah, I'm just yeah. excited about wireless charging. I just in 70 minutes, guys. Yeah, mm. right. I know. Let's one. go to the talk about practical. Let's that go to the Pro 5G. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where to put my fingers on that old screen phone. Right? It's, that's <laughs> you'll get we're... used to it. You'll get used to it. <laughs> There's yeah. no and, neck. <laughs> and and sort of launch apps as I'm trying to dial for something. Uh, in other news, Facebook announced it's acquiring CTRL Labs or Control Labs, maker of software to let people control a digital avatar with their thoughts. Control Labs uses a bracelet to measure neuron activity in a person's arm to determine movement that person is thinking even without physical movement. The bracelet broadcasts that information, which is used to create movement on a digital screen. 
it's not as whiz bang as the neural nets that you know uh, Elon Musk is involved in investing in, uh, where they put stuff in your actual head. Um, but this could be incredibly useful, and and certainly in prosthetics, uh, it has a very obvious uh, implementations. Why Facebook wants it, I don't know. Sarah, is it augmented reality, virtual reality, something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think Facebook is is demonstrating that it is very interested in the future of this. Also, the idea of implanting something, wow, cool, medically, scientifically, is a harder sell for a lot of people. Wearing a bracelet that's like, your arm will tell your brain what you're going <laughs> to do before you do it, and then your little avatar on the screen is going to do something, that's that's fun. You know, that that if, if it works correctly, and it's something that Facebook can, I don't know, uh, incorporate into their uh, their overall experience... I think that that is that that is a much easier adoption rate for the uh, the the majority of people who use Facebook. Uh, I think there are a million use cases for this. Uh, one of them, which came to my mind immediately, is VR um, or AR. Even if you think of the future, what they're doing with Luxottica, Lux, the you know Oakley company, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. an AR uh, headset. The problem with AR is how to control it. That would answer it. But even in general, controlling something, and of course, for now, it's just movement, um, and it's relatively simple, but maybe they're hoping that you could control more things just by thought, which is way more speedy than actually moving your hands and can have applications in many different uh, scenarios. I see, I mean, I think controlling through thought is kind of the ultimate user interface if it works precisely enough and complexly enough and all of that i'm not surprised at all to see facebook or anyone jump on something that shows promise in that field mm. Well, speaking of promise in a field softbank owned boston dynamics is selling its first major robot companies with a good idea can apply to purchase one uh code name spot four-legged robot that goes where you tell it avoids obstacles, it can also keep its balance in extreme conditions. It can support up to four hardware modules to add capabilities like a methane detector, a mesh radio for long-range connectivity, LiDAR for 3D mapping. Boston Dynamics is working with Cirque du Soleil on possible uses in entertainment as well. However, Spot is meant for closed, controlled, and largely human-free spaces. Boston Dynamics is well known for its impressive demo uh, videos, and one of those came out as well, showing the 330-pound bipedal Atlas robot doing some impressive gymnastics tumbling. So yeah. they're working on multiple robots. Spot is, you know, not necessarily consumer-facing. Atlas is the one you're you're going to see on YouTube today. Uh, Spot is actually the bigger news, in my opinion. Uh, Boston Dynamics Spot is Boston Dynamics finally addressing the big criticism, which is, you make great viral videos, Boston Dynamics, you never ship a product. Uh, and Boston Dynamics is shipping a product. Now, granted, it's it's prototype. Uh, you, you, you can't just go in and buy it, even if you're an industri industrial cu customer. You have to talk to them about how you're going to use it, because I think they want the usage to feed into their research. They also don't want it to be used for military uses. Uh, search and rescue and, and stuff like that to police departments, fine, but they don't want it to be used in, in actions that could harm someone. Uh, they just don't need that right now. And yes, it has to be something where human interaction is controlled because while this can avoid obstacles, it's not really meant to avoid injuries. Uh, so I'm very curious what they do with Cirque du Soleil because they could just have a whole stage full of dancing robots out there uh, and that would be pretty <laughs> interesting. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of practical uses for it as well. And we're actually going to see them in the wild now. It's, right. I, you know, we're going to start seeing videos of people interacting with them like with actual robots, if they're in a the field or somewhere, possibly well, I mean, somewhat unattended. It's not like it's going to be out at the mall or your airport or anything like that. Because do, do you know that? We don't yeah, know. Uh, they said Any specifically that can... it will not be in situations like that because it's too dangerous. Oh, <laughs> so it has well, to be like a I'm controlled situation. Mm. All right. Well, never mind. Closely the... closed, controlled, and largely human-free spaces. Mm. Well, uh, Boston Dynamics... I, in one, on one hand, I'm disappointed. At the same time, I'm kind of happy that the takeover of our robots overlord is delayed a little bit further. 
<laughs> well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Do it now before the robot overlords come. <laughs> all right. Last week, we mentioned that Valve had lost a Paris district court case in France over whether Steam customers in Europe had the right to resell their digital game purchases. Now, to oversimplify, the EU rules that require the free movement of goods within the European Union prohibit a company from deciding if you can resell a product you bought from them, and the court said those rules apply to digital copies of games. Valve has three months to amend its terms of service to comply with the ruling. However, Steam is appealing the case, and the ruling will not need to be followed while the case is on appeal, so don't get ready to sell your digital games from Steam quite yet. However, it does bring up a very interesting question. Whatever the courts end up deciding is a good thing or a bad thing to let people sell used copies of games or any digital media. Now, you may be tempted to say it's obviously a good thing, Tom, for us, the consumer. But, Patrick, I don't think that's the end of the discussion, is it? Uh, I would say it isn't. Um, as you said, it's very tempting to think, well, if I buy a thing in the physical world, then I can sell it to whomever I want. Why shouldn't things work like that in the digital realm? And I think that's a very fair point. And maybe uh, at the end of the day, the result of that conversation is that, yes, it should be the same. However, I would like to propose a few things for your consideration. Um, I think the idea that people get in their head when they think we're going to be able to sell digital items, uh, let's say a movie or a game, many games are uh, uh, bought digitally, is, you know, I want to go to Craigslist and say, hey, I have this game I bought a month ago, I finished it, who can give me 25 bucks for it? The reality is that the way it will work um, probably is automated uh, auction houses. So because all of these things develop and people make things automated on the internet. So you go to an auction house and you immediately have access to the entire offering of the entire world for all of these games and you automatically select the lowest price for that thing. So you, you can't really even selling at a higher price than the lower price because people who are buying always have access to the lower price in the country at a minimum, possibly in larger areas. So already here, I think this puts a dent in the idea that you're going to be able to sell it in the way that you sell a physical uh, game. The other aspect of this, which I immediately see, is the industry has kind of integrated the fact that these goods can be resold, and the price chain has adapt adapted to that fact. Um, the prices of games go down very quickly and, you know, within a couple of months by 30% or something like that. And within six months, you have sales that make the, the prices a, a, a deal, a super, you know, bargain. And those kind of take the place of um, uh, uh, secondhand prices while still uh, getting money to the creator because the other big issue in secondhand sale, of course, is the creators don't get the money. Um, so they take the, the, those prices are still there if you want to buy it, uh, but they still give money to the creator. So I don't know that the consumer would be better off if the, the, those things disappear because since you can resell the games anyway, then the prices in the initial prices and the sales kind of, get more difficult to to uh, be competitive. So there are these two elements, there are a few more, which make me think maybe what's actually happening in the current marketplace is that there's sort of a uh, natural selection that took into account the fact that a digital good is sold and then not resold to create the best possible version of the marketplace around it. And changing it might not get the results that we would hope. Yeah, my, my problem with this is that I come from a place where I don't see digital media as equivalent to physical media. And that was has always been and still is my problem with digital rights management, with DRM. Uh, it is an infinitely copyable medium. And I think it's silly to treat it like an MP3 is like a record. Uh, when you sell a chair, you sell the usage, the access, uh, the wear and tear, all of it at once. 
and then you have that share. So it makes sense to have a right of first sale uh, where you can say, hey, I get to sell this chair to someone else because everything passes to them. And the person who made the chair got the compensation for making the chair the first time they sold it. I don't think that's the way digital media works. Uh, and and so because I don't like that with digital rights management, I also don't like it with reselling used digital copies because they're not used. There's no wear and tear. There's no way to differentiate one copy from another unless you add DRM, which I don't believe is a great system. So I have real problems with this because to me, digital, as I mentioned earlier in the show, digital media is about access. You sell, you can only sell access. I don't think you can treat it like individual products. So I, I have problems with the basis for this interpretation. And, and that's the, the, essentially what they're doing today. They're really selling you the access. They're selling you a license to use a game or a movie mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and I think that's also where the issue comes from because the nom nomenclature might be the issue. They're saying we're selling you this item. Well, in reality, they're not. So maybe the solution is as technically technical and simple as we could imagine, just redefining what that sale is uh, and just saying we're selling you the access for 50 years or whatever um, and not the game itself and make it more clear because as it stands um, it's been decided and judged by the courts that this is tantamount to sale at the moment yeah, so maybe yeah. it needs to be more clear and also we're moving to more and more subscriptions so that Took words might out of my mouth. not be yeah. as yeah, yeah. Um, google so, stadia subs other subscription services oh, like a yeah. million of them, especially Total. in gaming. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes there are gaming stories, sometimes there aren't. You can submit those that you think should catch our eye and also vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right. Uh, we had a, an update from Chris Christensen uh, yesterday uh, that, that has some very serious implications in our mailbag. Yeah. And um, Rob wrote in about it and said, I was on a flight from London in the UK to Atlanta back in 20, uh, 2003. And an elderly gentleman did, in fact, have a massive heart attack in the lavatory and died. They discovered this because a line had begun to form, which prompted a flight attendant to finally come around and knock on the door. Didn't get an answer. Unlocked the door. We had to make an emergency landing in Canada and then sat on the runway for three hours because they had to refuel and also get a new flight plane to complete our trip. We couldn't deplane because Canada was neither our country of origin or destination. So letting us off the plane would have involved processing us through customs. Rob says, I don't know if the system described which which, uh, which um, Chris did describe as potentially <laughs> making this whole process at least easier to figure out, not easier to you know keep people healthy necessarily, but it says it would have allowed them to make an earlier intervention and it would have made a difference in the outcome. I can certainly see where it would be a potential benefit. Yeah, so this, the system yesterday was sensors that would allow flight attendants to tell how long a bathroom door had been locked. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, it may, it may not have helped in this case, but it's certainly the kind of thing where it would be good rather than waiting until you see a line building up and people complaining to, yeah. you know, maybe have a little alert that goes off that says, hey, you know, we've they've passed a time limit. You might want to check on them. Exactly. Well, thanks to Rob for writing in about this um, safe plan in the future. And also thanks to Patrick Bajop for being with us today. Patrick, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, if you go to frenchspin.com, it's very easy to remember. It's French and spin. That's <laughs> frenchspin.com. Uh, you can find Pixels, which is a show I do about video games, and you'll probably enjoy it if you like video games. And you will also find The Phileas Club, for which the latest episode is a special on China in Africa. And we've all heard about China and Africa, and I think many of us have wondered exactly what it's about. Well, wonder no more. Go check out that episode. And I think not only will you learn a, a little bit, but also you might enjoy what you hear and uh, have a good time. So uh, frenchspin.com for both of those shows. 
Yeah, uh, I listened to that episode uh, when it came out last week, uh, and it is uh, both entertaining and extremely informative. If you're the kind of person who's like, man, how do I break outside of my bubble? I want to know some things that no one else will tell me. Turn off the TV. Uh, don't read a local newspaper. Go subscribe to the Phileas Club, uh, and that will that will help expand that horizon. Folks, we're Thank changing you, our Patreon rewards starting October 1st, so you have less than a week to sign up for the classic <laughs> rewards. Uh, or you can just wait till October 1st first uh, and get the new rewards. Current rewards will be delivered after the end of this month and the new rewards first to be delivered November 1st. And if you want to know what's coming in October, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us early and often. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more and tell a friend dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>